Welcome to this year's Act of Remembrance at Leicester College. We're not able to come together physically this year for obvious reasons, but we can meet virtually to remember all those who gave their lives in conflicts and wars across the world and those who volunteered and keep volunteering to keep us safe. Thanks to everyone who's made this thoughtful event possible. Once more, we use this time to look back and remember. We are not doing so to celebrate war or any particular country, group or religion. It is simply reflection in the hope that what happened in the 20th century is never to be repeated. 2020 has turned into a difficult year. For me, it started on January the 1st with the death of my last remaining grandparent, my nana. When clearing a house, it didn't take long to find evidence of both world wars. She was, like many who had lived through the war and rationing, a borderline hoarder. We found tins of food older than some of her great-grandchildren. There was a cupboard full of packs of toilet roll. In January, we were laughing about this and wondered what she could possibly have been predicting. A few months later, we were all very grateful for her foresight. She will never know it, but she kept three generations of her family well stocked through the toilet paper crisis of March 2020. On the wall was great granddad's mentioned in dispatches certificate, a small slip of thin paper around A5 size with calligraphy and the royal arms on top. In the living room in pride of place was their wedding photo. The wall restricted material, so her wedding dress was not the silk she had hoped for, that all went for the parachutes, she would whisper as though it was a wartime secret that could still not be revealed. She was only 18 when they married. Grandad, all of 20 years old, was in the uniform of a soldier, although not the ceremonial uniform that you could have expected. Instead, it was the khaki battle dress, a short jacket with a wrap belt, trousers bloused at the, at the boots, and the material was woolen serge, which, when combined with the woolen shirt, must have been incredibly hot uh, in the summertime. If we ever dared ask Grandad about the war, he would only ever tell us that the uniforms were horribly scratchy and never fitted properly. He would mutter something along the lines of, war is hell, and then cheerfully change the subject. Looking at the wedding photos, I began to wonder more about my nan's wartime life. In the last months of her life, I would visit her with my small dog and she would sit with my Jack Russell on her lap, reminiscing, stroking the dog who was really only there because Nana would drop more of her digestive biscuit than she ever managed to eat. But while she never went back to that period in her memory during the last year she was alive, she had told us plenty about the war when we were children. The battle on the home front was key across both world wars. For my nan, it involved working in a factory that stopped making parts for the car industry and instead moved to making artillery shells. She was always quick to point out that the explosives were added at a different location, holding out hands that shook dramatically. The home front saw women take on all manner of jobs that had previously been thought to be man's work, such as driving transport, including double-decker buses and steam trains. In the Midlands here, Factory work, such as manning uh, jobs uh, with machines, were taken over as the men left to join the various armed forces. It was one of these jobs that a 16-year-old version of my grandmother started. At the end of the war, the women who, in the main, would return to their lives, while the men would return to reclaim their jobs. But on each occasion, the door was open just a little to demonstrate that women were equally capable in these roles as men. My nan lived through the Blitz in Coventry. While Grandad and Great Grandad would never talk about the war with us as children, Nana could be relied upon to tell us all about her experience. How in the evening they would hear the air raid sirens and go to the shelter at the bottom of the garden. If she was lucky, she would have a letter from Grandad. He was known to my great grandmother then as that soldier our Marge has found, in vaguely disapproving tones. But she came round to him quickly enough when he returned for good. If there was not a letter, then Nan said she would simply listen to the crump of far-off explosions, wondering and worrying not for herself, 
but for him. She told us how the postman was welcomed by all, but the telegraph boy was dreaded, an indication of the good or bad news that each person delivered respectively. That generation is now known as the greatest generation. They are almost all gone. Any remaining are viewed as remarkable people. A recent example of this would be Captain Tom, the veteran who, at 100 years old, raised money for the NHS by walking laps of his garden. He not only reached the target he set, but exceeded it by millions. For this effort, Captain Tom was being made an honorary colonel of his old regiment and also knighted by the Queen. It certainly was a generation made up of people with an extraordinary mindset. As we face an uncertain future ourselves, today we reflect on those who have come before us. These were people who faced genuine hardship and an unknown future for everyone. They gave up more than personal freedoms. Food was scarce, materials for clothes rationed, petrol reserved for vehicles that were for essential war use only. Most car owners put their vehicles on blocks over the war. Men were sent across the world to fight an enemy that could be found in the deserts of North Africa or the jungles of Far East Asia, as well as the hedgerows of Northern Europe. For those left behind, there was only the worry, uncertainty and dread. There were periods in time where bombing of this country would increase, usually as weapons were developed. The first blitz, cities and towns were bombed with 500 and 1,000 pound bombs. The little blitz came later in the war when parachute mines were dropped and incendiary devices nearly burned down half of London. Later in the war, buzz bombs came, high explosives strapped to a rocket like an oversized firework. It was indiscriminate as no one could tell where it would land, not even those who had fired it. All of this culminated in the V-2, the first ever ballistic missile. Through all this, the people of this generation simply kept living their lives, trying not to let the war get too much in the way. The British people took pride in their ability to take it and carry on regardless. When Buckingham Palace was bombed, the Queen Mother was supposed to have said that she could now at least look the East End in the eye. They shared an experience. Both had had their homes bombed. So here we are, close to the end of 2020, and we wonder how it will all end. What will history make of those who have lived through this year? For certain, we can never come close to being compared to those who have lived through the wars. But even so, there are families now who have lost loved ones. So we can take this time to remember them too. When Christians think about remembrance, they're often drawn to some words of Jesus, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. We sometimes talk about people making this ultimate sacrifice of dying so that others might live. While most of us will never face that choice, there are at least three things we can do. Remember, respect and respond. First, to remember. We must recognise the grim reality of war, not just the sanitised version that often appears in computer games or in films. War breaks people. There's a really well-known book in the field of trauma studies called The Body Keeps the Score. And the author's point is exactly that, that our bodies remember trauma we experience uh, and can re re continually relive that trauma if we don't experience help. There are many people who have been traumatised by war and we must remember their pain. And I think we must remember the realities of war and how sadly things seem to repeat themselves. Uh, if you'd ever visit, visited the Auschwitz concentration camp, one of the things that would stay with you, as it stayed with me since my visit many years ago, is the huge pile of human hair. But most recently, uh, only this year on the news, we saw uh, hair from Uyghur Muslims being used to make wigs. And it's, it's frighteningly reminiscent of what happened in Auschwitz. We have to remember what's going on, even if we personally can't do very much to change what is happening. Secondly, I think we need to respect. Respect those who are prepared to sacrifice themselves. This, I think, is true whatever your personal opinion is about war in general or about the particular wars and conflicts the UK is and has been involved with. 
Frontline serving soldiers aren't really the people to debate government policy with. They deserve our respect for their willingness to put themselves in harm's way, much as they've done during the COVID-19 lockdown as well as many other times. Third, I think a day like Remembrance Day calls us to respond appropriately. This might include buying a poppy, donating to a charity that supports ex-service personnel, or even working with organisations that promote peace and reconciliation amongst communities and groups that disagree with each other. We may not be able to bring about world peace, but we can at least work for greater peace and understanding with our family and friends. Let us take time today, therefore, to remember to respect and to respond. We will now be having readings from our Students' Union representatives of The Soldier by Rupert Brooke and For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust who England bore, shaped, made aware, Gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of homes, and think this heart all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less. Give somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter learned of friends, and gentleness in heart at peace under. An English heaven. With proud thanksgiving and love for her children, England mourns for her dead across the sea. Flesh of her flesh they were, spirit of her spirit, fallen in the course of a free. Solemn the drums thrill, death august and royal, sings sorrows up into immortal spheres. There's music in the midst of desolation and a glory that shines upon our tears. They went with songs to the battle, they were young. Straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the bone. They should grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age should not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. They mingle not with their laughing comrades again. They sit no more at familiar tables at home. They have no lot in our labour of the daytime. They sleep beyond England's foam. But where our, des where our desires are and our hope profound, felt as wellspring that is hidden from sight, to the innermost heart of our own land, they are known, as the stars are known to the night. As the stars that shall be bright when we are dust, moving in marches upon the heavenly plain, as the stars that are starry in the time of our darkness, to the end, to the end, they remain.